Today we're going to begin a journey through Genesis. So the good news is it'll be easy to find if you just open to the front of your Bible. Um, we're going to go through the book of Genesis, and Lord willing, we'll see if we make it back through it before he comes back. Um, but we're going to try. We're going to work towards it anyways, and uh, we're going to go to the Lord and, and ask him for help this morning. Father, I want to thank you so much for all the help that you give us through your word, all the promises that you give us in your word, that give us hope and give us life. And all of that starts with the book of Genesis. Lord, as we venture through this, I pray that you would help me to remain faithful to your word. I pray, Father, that you would open our hearts and our, our ears to hear what you have for us, that we would be able to accept this incredible account by faith, trusting that every word is true and accurate, and that, Father, though we can't understand it all, we accept that you created this world and you created us and you put things in movement that, Father, will in the end bring you the most glory. I pray, Father, that uh, this would draw us closer to you, our creator, in Christ's name, amen. So today we're, we're going to do an introduction, which basically means we're not even going to get to verse 1 today. <laughs> We're going to do an introduction of Genesis. I think there's some very important truths that um, we need to, to uh, make sure that we understand before journeying through a book like this, which is very different from the book of Romans, for sure. The word Genesis literally means origin or beginning. Um, this beginning book of Scripture is actually a book about origins. The book of Genesis reveals how the world began, how time began, how humanity began, how our relationship with God began. This book shares with us how marriage began, how parenting began, how relationships began, how gender roles began, how sin began, how a messed up world began, how pain began began, how our broken relationship with God began, how numerous languages began, how the nation of Israel began, how God's covenant with men began, and how salvation, the plan of salvation began. So clearly Genesis is a book of beginnings, a book of origins. Think, think about what we would not know if it were not for Genesis. Think about all the foundational questions, the, the purpose of man, why are we here, how did we get here, why is things so messed up today? All these foundational questions that every human being at one time has all answered in the book of Genesis. How many questions of origins are answered in the first book of Holy Scripture? Yet I would say, of all the books of the Bible, it is this foundational book that is under the most attack today. I would say that today the book of Genesis and all of its truths are under more attack than any other book in Scripture. The world wants us to believe that science and history have time and time again disproven this foundational book of the Bible. That's what our culture tells us. Well, the book of Genesis can't be true. Science and history has disproved it many times. Sadly, according to a Gallup poll done in 2019, 44% of professing Protestant Christians do not believe that God created the world. Let me say that again, because that's, that's just hard to believe. 44% of professing Christians that go to a Protestant church do not believe that God created the world. What is telling is that in the same poll that they found that 48% of Americans who do not have a college education believe that God created the world versus only 23% of those who do have a college education. See the big difference? 
don't go to college, you're more likely to believe that God created the world. Go to college, and you're a lot less likely to believe that God created the world. Why would that be? This illustrates the demise of a biblical conviction on the Genesis account. And that this demise is a result of a twofold problem. First of all, you have the indoctrination of evolution that's being pushed upon our youth in every secular college, every secular school, as well as the unwillingness of so many churches to proclaim the countercultural truths found in Genesis. So on one hand, you've got the lies coming from the, the secular colleges that are saying evolution's true. God didn't create the world. There is no creator. It all just kind of evolved and happened through evolutionary processes. And then you have, on the other hand, the church doing nothing to combat that. Just staying silent on the matter. And sometimes even worse, buying in to that lie. When the truth is not proclaimed, the lie will prevail for sure. And it has. Not only concerning creation, but concerning the family, concerning gender, concerning sexuality, concerning equality and life itself. In fact, I'd venture to say that almost every hot topic in our culture today is three chapters of God's Word. It's amazing when you think about it. The truths found in Genesis are foundational for our faith in God. If we can't trust the first chapters of God's Word, we can't trust any of it. Because As the church has tried to become more and more culturally acceptable with their teaching, they have lost almost an entire generation who were never taught why they should believe God's word in its entirety. So what the church has kind of dreamt up is, oh, we're using all these, we're losing all these youth because they think, well, I believe in evolution, that's what I was taught, and and therefore. Scripture can't be true, and so the church has come along and said, oh, yeah, 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 we don't, we don't take Genesis as, as God's inspired word like we do the rest of the Bible. You can throw that away and, and accept the rest of it, and our, our, our cultural church has come to the point of thinking, that'll work, that'll keep them. But our youth have, have looked right through it, have seen right through the lies and decided, well, if I can't trust the first book of the Bible... I can't trust any of it. And so they're walking away from the church in drones. They were cast. We're casting this generation into a world of lies, unable to defend the truth of God's word. It's like throwing our kids out into a world and not giving them the tools they need to combat the lies that are coming at them. So my prayer is that God would use this foundational book to equip each of us, no matter our age, to be able to defend every one of our origins, to hold to true, biblically rooted convictions, to expose the lies of the culture to ourselves, to our children, to our grandchildren, to our friends, to our community, and to our world. To let them understand the lies that are being told and what God's Word clearly says. Today I want to give an, an, a very important introduction to this foundational book. and I want to address five very important introductory points that will aid our journey through this book. Simple truths that you might take for granted, but that are extremely important when going through a book like this. First of all, God authored the book of Genesis through Moses. You may not know this, but the first five books of the Bible, which is called the Torah or the Pentateuch, was all one book. Okay, It was divided up later. For, for, for to be able to address different references easier. But in Jesus' day and before Jesus' day, it was all one book. And it was called the Torah or the Pentateuch. And this one book was written by Moses. 
Throughout the Bible, this collection of early inspired writings were called the Book of Moses. Oftentimes it was called the Book of Moses in Scripture or the Law of Moses because Moses wrote them and gave them to the nation of Israel. In Deuteronomy chapter 31, we're told that when Moses had finished writing the words of this book, this law, in a book to the very end, he wrote the entire thing, Moses commanded the Levites who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, take this book of the law and put it by the side of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God that it may be there for a witness against you. So this is the entire Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. All of that was written down, a book of law, and it was given to Israel. This account was written to Israel to explain to them their origin as a nation. It was to help them understand, where did you guys come from as a nation? How did you get to be the people of God? And what God had commanded them to do. That's what was in the book of Moses. When it comes to the entire book of Genesis and the first part of Exodus, Moses was not writing about events that he had an eyewitness account to. Obviously, the book of Genesis happened before Moses was even born. So how then did Moses write Genesis? knowing they happened before his time. Well, that's not hard to figure out because Moses had a very special relationship with a personal eyewitness of the entire Genesis account. So one doesn't have to wonder how Moses came to learn the information found in the book of Genesis. Exodus 31.11 tells us that the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Isn't that awesome? So if you're Moses and you're able to speak with God face to face and you're able to ask him anything, wouldn't it start with, how did this world get here? How, how, did, how did marriage start? How did the family start? How did all these languages get here? How did, how did the world get to the mess that it's in today? How did, I mean, wouldn't you just ask God all of those questions if you could have a conversation with him face to face? Clearly, these are things that God revealed to Moses. Verse Exodus 24, 4 says, Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. The Lord spoke to Moses. Moses wrote what God told him to write. Therefore, the book of Genesis is God's perfect account. Okay, we have an eyewitness account, God Himself telling us how the world began, how the nation of Israel began, and why He created it the way He did. So that's very important to remember. We can have tremendous confidence in the book of Genesis, just like any other book, because God spoke to Moses and told him what to write. Secondly, and by the way, historically this has always been accepted. Um, it's always been accepted that since Genesis is a part of the Torah, that Moses wrote that account. Secondly, the book of Genesis is an accurate historical account, a very accurate historical account. This is the most important thing I can say concerning the introductory points of Genesis, okay? This is very important to note because, here's why this is so important, all biblically historic account, if it's history that's being recorded in Scripture, then they are meant to be interpreted literally. Okay? History is meant to be um, interpreted as literally. So if, if, if Genesis is a historical account, then that means when we study Genesis, we're taking it as historical facts. Okay, if you want to know more about history, you can talk to Rick here. He's our history buff in the church. And when he goes back and he reads history, he sees facts and he doesn't think, ah, oh, maybe this is figurative. You know, maybe 1936 is figurative. No, that's a literal account. So it's a literal number. Historical facts are always interpreted literally. Okay, and this is important because the entire Torah is a historical account. So that means whenever the Torah mentions a place 
or a person's name or numbers or things like that. They are all meant to be very accurate account. They are meant to be taken literally, not figuratively, not allegorically, not symbolically, but literally. That's so important to remember as we go through the book of Genesis, okay? And, and I can prove this from Scripture. We could spend all morning talking about the fact that the authors of Scripture, every author of Scripture that quotes Genesis takes it as a literal account. Jesus himself refers to Adam, to creation, to Abel, to Noah, to the flood, to Abraham, to Lot, to Sodom and Gomorrah as historical people, as literal events that happened, and as places that really exist. All of Scripture denotes that Genesis is a literal account. I'll give you just a couple illustrations. Matthew 19, 4, Jesus is answering a question about whether or not there'll be marriage in heaven and how divorce is, all that's going to work when we get to heaven. And he says, in answering that question, he says, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? So he says, Don't you understand where marriage originated? If you read the book of Genesis, a literal account, it tells you that God created Adam male and female. And female. Jesus used that as an example of a real historical event. Mark 10, 6, he does the same thing. From the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. God made them. They were made by God. Well, Jesus, how do you? Because Genesis says we can know that God made Adam and Eve because Genesis, a historical account, says that's what happened. Now, this doesn't mean that there's no allegorical or symbolic things within its account. There very well may be. But the primary interpretation of Genesis is to be literal. Now, you're probably thinking, Pastor, why would you spend that much time sharing that with us? Well, here's why this is very important. What has happened over the last few decades is the church has been guilty of moving away from a literal interpretation of Genesis simply because they can't mend Genesis and evolution together. So the church has, has, has kind of backed off and said, oh, ooh, that doesn't match up with what they're teaching in the schools. Therefore, we're going to have to take this another way other than literally. So... What happens is they can't mend the two together. So what they do is embrace evolutionary principles and explain Genesis as a story told to teach us certain truths about God. This is, let me tell you, this is huge in Christian seminaries today. A lot of Christian seminaries, Bible schools, will teach Genesis as an a, 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 a account that's just stories to teach us something about God. They didn't literally happen. In other words, so many in the church today do not believe that God literally spoke creation into existence. They do not believe that there was a worldwide flood that took place. They do not believe that man was created from dust, but rather he evolved. From different species. They take the stories of Genesis as just fictional stories. They must be, they reason, since science does not allow for them to be factually true. Because they've been given this false notion that science and the Bible contradict. But that's simply not the case. True Observable science never contradicts God's word. But evolution is not science. And since no real evidence of evolution exists, there is no reason to doubt the historical account given by the only true eyewitness of creation. Do not buy into that lie. So I'll admit right up front, 
especially to the youth here today, this book most certainly contradicts what is being taught in biology class concerning evolution. I'll just flat out tell you, absolutely it contradicts it. I will spend no time trying to mesh the two together. Either evolution is false or God's word is false. And I've chosen to stand on God's word, which I believe when I look at observable science and what we can really observe and what we can really see, I believe there's far more scientific evidence pointing to creation rather than evolutionary processes over millions and millions of years. I just don't have enough faith to believe in evolution. Some of these challenges will be addressed as we go through the first two chapters of Genesis, but I want to warn you ahead of time, this is a literal account, and we will take it as literal, and we will be able to see why there's so much evidence pointing towards what happened in this book. And so that's why we will be talking about the flood as an actual event that really happened. We'll be talking about creation and the fall as literal events that actually happened. Because there's no doubt in my mind that's exactly what Genesis is, a historical account. Third, this is important to remember, you may not know that the book of Genesis covers over one half of all of Bible's history. So it covers over a half of the entire Bible's history. Right? The historical account of Genesis covers at least 2,286 years. That's the span of the historical account of Genesis. The remaining 65 books of the Bible covers about 1,814 years of history. So Genesis is covering more time than the rest of the Bible put together. Okay? To put that into modern perspective, just to get our minds around this, the book of Genesis covers a longer time frame than that, that which has passed since Jesus walked the earth. So going from here, where we're at now in 2022, all the way back to Jesus, Genesis covers more time than that. This is a huge time frame that, that, that has covered in the book of Genesis. In fact, 2,000 of those 2,286 2, years are covered in the first 11 chapters of Genesis. So Genesis 1 through 11 covers 2,000 years. That's a little less than a third of all of human history covered in 11 chapters. Now that's important to remember because as we go through Genesis... We've got to remember that this is, this is a huge time span that is being um, recorded for us in a, just a few chapters. Obviously, that being the case, the details are going to be rather vague. right? If you're covering that much history, only a few chapters, the details are going to be very, very vague. There's going to be a lot of things that are left out. Um, Considering, consider the beginning of this book to be a quick summary of the first 2,000 years of our Earth's history. So you may think, oh, why didn't he talk about this? Or why didn't he tell us more? Or this or that? Well, it's just a, it's just a very vague history um, as they go through that. So that'll be some interesting stuff when we get to genealogies and stuff like that. I'm sure Rick will enjoy that more than most of us, but it's good stuff. <laughs> Next, the book of Genesis leaves us with a lot of unanswered questions. Because the details are vague, normally historical summaries usually do leave out a lot of details. Okay? Now, this is, a, this is a very mysterious book, to say the least. And if you're curious like me, the first few chapters of this book will leave you with a lot of questions. A lot of questions that cannot be affirmatively answered. Okay, Genesis brings up some pretty wild things that just are hard to accept. And then it just moves on, leaving us begging for more information. This is where commentators enjoy speculating and dreaming up all sorts of possibilities. Um, I'll do my best as we go through Genesis to share some of the more plausible views, but... 
I want to make sure I distinguish those from what Scripture actually says. And sometimes what Scripture actually says leaves us with a lot of questions. And one must be okay with being left with more questions than answers at times. I believe, and I've always believed, that God reveals exactly what he wants us to know but he also refrains from revealing what he doesn't want us to know. And there are things that God deliberately does not reveal to us. And though that leaves us with questions and it leaves us to wonder, I think that's exactly where God wants us to be. You know what? I don't know all the details, but I trust God. I trust God. And if he didn't want me to know this, I don't have to know it. And being willing to move on from there. there will be a, you'll, you'll understand as we go through Genesis why that is a very important point to remember. God has his divine purpose in all of this. In what he told Moses to write and what he didn't tell Moses to write. And we must trust that we have recorded exactly what he wanted revealed to us. No more, no less. And that leaves us, brings us to our last point here. The book of Genesis, as really any book in Scripture, requires us to exercise faith over reasoning. This is a book that must, in some part, be accepted by faith rather than reasoning. Human reasoning has always been a deterrent for accepting the hard-to-believe portions of Scripture. Even before evolution... Many scholars have struggled to accept Genesis as a literal account due to not understanding how some of its record could reasonably be true. And I've learned a lot about this this week, reading back into a few scholars back in the Reformed periods of 15, 1600s, going all the way back to the 3rd and 4th century of a few scholars that just really had a hard time believing that Genesis was a literal account. And do you know, out of reading all of that, the number one reason, the number one thing that bothered scholars that they just couldn't understand that really caused them to hesitate to accept this as a literal account, it was the fact that they couldn't explain, and this is crazy, they couldn't explain what Noah and his family would have done with all the the animal waste on the ark. They couldn't explain it. Well, what did they do? I, boy, this is really hard to accept as a literal account because we can't explain what they did with all of this. It, it kind of cracks me up to think, that bothered them that much? But when we got to explain everything rather than just accept it, it can drive us crazy, for sure. Some have refused to accept Genesis as the literal account simply because they could not explain how dealing with a problem like that could be possible. In fact, if you've ever been to the Ark Encounter in Kentucky, you will notice that there's a lot of attention given to that topic of what are some possible ways they could have dealt with it. And that's why, because historically that has been a hang-up for a lot of people. So it's true, it is true that if you take Genesis as a literal historical account, you will run into things that are just very hard to believe. The Bible is filled with truths that must be believed even though we can't explain how they can be true. At some point, as Christians, we have to decide, we have to choose, are we willing to accept God's word by faith? Or are we going to lean on our own understanding? Proverbs 3, 5 reminds us not to lean on our own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. I encourage you as we go through Genesis, trust the historical account. Trust that the Lord has given us exactly what he wants us to have And by trusting that, when we get to those hard-to-believe things and we get to those mysterious things that we don't have answers for, we will be willing to accept it for what it says. In fact, I'm going to close today by reading the first 12 verses of the 11th chapter of Hebrews. Okay, this is 
Hebrews chapter 11. I want to read the first 12 verses of this. Because not only does this clearly demonstrate that Genesis is, in, is a literal historical account. Since every person on this, in this, uh, these verses and every event mentioned is, comes from the book of Genesis. But it also illustrates the importance of accepting these truths by faith. Okay? So I want you to notice how the author of Hebrews accepts these events, accepts these people as it, literal things that have happened, as well as how we must accept them. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old, real people that existed back in the old days, Receive their condemnation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. Well, he, he believes that the universe was created by God speaking it to existence. How can he do that? By faith. By faith. Can we prove it? There's things we have to accept by faith. So that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. It's very interesting because that's the exact opposite of evolution. Things that are made out of nothing. Um, by faith. Here we go through this list of real people that really existed. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he really lived and he really died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch, a mysterious man we know little about, was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned of God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he commended the world, condemned the world, and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that was to receive it as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, real people, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, was born descendants as many as the stars of heaven, and as many as the innumerable grains of sands by the seashore. I would say that is a good summary of Genesis. That's how the nation of Israel began. From, from Adam all the way to Abraham, God's covenant with Abraham, and there they are as a nation, innumerable grains of sand. Real people, real event, accepted by real faith. This book, as we go through this, this book will certainly stretch your faith. But my prayer is that as it does, it will strengthen your faith in God's perfect word. Father, as we close today and just look forward to venturing through this glorious book, this account that you have graciously given us to answer so many questions and yet to give us an awe and a wonder at what we don't understand. I pray, Father, that as your people, through this account, you would 
ground in us foundational biblical convictions of our origins. And that as we accept this book by faith, Lord, we be able to defend it to, against the masses of lies that our culture is telling us. That we can raise up a generation who believe and trust in your word and your word alone. I pray it in Christ's name. Amen.